always and for everything all the time. And thank you, Lord, that you are sufficient for every one of those needs. You're the answer to every problem, the wisdom that we need for every single situation. Thank you that your love knows no bounds, that your mercy is new every morning. And thank you, Lord, that we're seeing it poured out in our lives. Lord, thank you for Malcolm's successful surgery. Thank you for Boaz joining us in the land of the breathing, that mom and son and dad are all doing great. Lord, thank you for Greg's continued recovery from surgery. And Lord, we pray that same mercy would be with our brother Steve Schnurris. Uh, he's back in the hospital with complications following a surgery. Be with our brother James as he's laid low once again with some kind of creeping crud that he just cannot shake. Lord, have mercy on that brother. He is so faithful. And Lord, we pray for his mom as uh, Grace continues to, to deal with ongoing chronic health stuff. Lord, we thank you that you are more than enough for these and for all of our needs. Lord, would you pour out your spirit now? Would you illuminate your word? Would you teach your people? Would you revive our hearts? We give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Grab a seat. Grab a Bible. Join me in 1 Corinthians 14. And if you want to get ahead of the game, you might also turn to 1 Timothy 2. We'll be there before we're done. But as Bibles, if you need a Bible, raise your hand, let them know. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Timothy chapter 2. I was doing announcements in the middle of all of my blasphemy and heresy. I forgot to mention our youth summer camp. And this is going to be a new thing for us. And when I say us, I mean all of the regional Calvaries. We're inviting everybody um, to join us down where we do the men's retreat, typically um, at Camp Horizon down in Ark City in July. Save those dates. Invite other youth, junior high and high school. I neglected to mention that. Um, pray for that, if you would. And pray for Aaron Sabio. Aaron Sabio, we've invited to be our guest speaker. Where do I know that name, Patrick? That sounds familiar. Aaron's currently the youth pastor at Calvary Vista, Calvary Vista in California, a church that has sent out many, many faithful workers to the field. Charlie Campbell, who many of you remember from his times here, came out of Calvary Vista. Before Aaron was there, he was director of On the Edge, a summer discipleship program. It no longer exists, at least in its previous form. But when it did, a lot of the people who are now young adults in our fellowship participated in it. My daughter, Juan, Kaylee, Andrew, Brittany, a, a, a bunch, and, and, and grew and, and benefited from that ministry. Um, Aaron actually... Uh, taught here, I think, four years ago on a Sunday morning. We had invited Aaron and some of the people he was running around with at the time, they called themselves Revo Collective, to put on a youth conference for us, the one-day unfiltered conferences that we were doing for a time. And so they came out with music and teaching and testimony, and, and of course, Aaron taught us Sunday morning. But, but while he and his team were here, a really interesting conversation ensued. Because when they sent us their schedule, we invited them. They said, what do you want us to do? We said, do your thing. So they said, okay, here's our thing. They sent us a schedule. And on that schedule, one of the main sessions, the name next to that session, the person scheduled to teach that session was a woman. Wonderful, godly woman named Faith. I knew her, loved her. But that raised a question. Is, is that okay for a woman to teach a main session, a mixed session with, with guys and girls both there. Why wouldn't that be okay? Well, because it's a mixed audience, men and women. Well, are they men and women or are they boys and girls? Does it make a difference? Does it make a difference if she's not the only speaker? Does it make a difference if someone else introduces her? Does it make a difference if she's sharing her testimony rather than unpacking doctrine? It was a really good conversation. And sadly, that's not always the case. As you may know, the conversation about the role of women in ministry over the last several years has really challenged and in many ways divided our tribe. If you're new to Calvary, 
you might not know that Calvary Wichita is part of a family of some 2,000 churches here in the United States and overseas. We grew out of the Jesus movement in the 60s and the 70s. And, and though we're now 2,000 churches strong, we're not a denomination. We've always resisted that title, and, and it, it's not just a title, it's a fact, because there is no central governance. Each Calvary Chapel is independent, fiercely <laughs> independent. And over the last few years, the godly men and women of those 2,000 fiercely independent churches have come down on different sides. They've reached a variety of conclusions around the right and proper role of women in ministry. Can women teach a mixed group, including men? Can women be pastors? Can women be senior pastors? Should women be speaking in church at all? I don't think we're going to resolve the debate this morning. And, and to be honest, it's not really my intention to try, but, but the thing is, this morning I can't ignore it either because we've arrived at the section of 1 Corinthians that includes a statement by Paul that's, that's one of a couple statements that's really at the heart of this controversy. And, and, and since where we are in Scripture obligates us to look at one of those statements, we're going to look at the other one, and that's why I said 1 Timothy 2. We're going to be in both places before we're done. I've already said, but, I, but, but I, I really want to make sure everybody hears, there are godly, thoughtful, prayerful, studious people in our tribe and outside of our tribe that look at the passages that we're going to look at this morning and reach all kinds of different conclusions. Some people try to oversimplify the issue and they make it about, are you on this side or that side? And there are people in our tribe that are that are. are basically balkanizing our movement. Well, you're, do you believe this or do you believe that? It's not nearly that simple. Before we even get started, I hope that you know, or at least I want you to know, this is not an either-or conversation. The more you dig into it, there's a whole spectrum of, of reasonable perspectives on the subject of women in ministry, women in leadership, women in the church. And all up and down that spectrum are people that I'm convinced love God and are filled with the Holy Spirit, and are prayerfully dedicated to the Word, and committed to loving God's people. And, and this morning, I'm going to try to be one of them. This morning, I'm going to share my perspective, not as a scholar or theologian, because I think you know I'm neither one, but as a guy who loves God and loves God's people and loves God's Word, and is, and is trying to do his prayerful, Spirit-filled best to understand what the Spirit says to the churches. And, and I hope that you'll go there with me. Lord, once more, we ask, as, as we go, Lord, go before us, go with us. Don't let us go apart from you. Lord, would you speak to your people this morning? In your name, amen. So I want to start by looking at the passage as a whole. I want to start big picture, and we're going to start where we left off last week, 1 Corinthians 14, 26. It's, it's going to be a moment before we get there, but when we get there, that's where we're going to be. I'm starting this way because it's important, and, and you know this, to always read Scripture, particularly controversial Scripture, in context. What is the, what, 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 what's the saying? A text without context is a pretext. It's an excuse. It's an excuse to ride a hobby horse, to advance a pet argument, to indulge in proof texting. I'm right, and the Bible says I'm right, because it says so right here in this verse that I've wrestled out of context and I'm deploying as a weapon against all of the other verses. If you've been walking with the Lord any length of time, you know if you torture Scripture enough, it'll confess to anything. How do we avoid that? How do we stay honest and open and accurate in our reading of Scripture. One way, probably, probably the best way, is to never read one Bible verse. To always read any verse in the context in which that verse appears. 
And our context this morning, as we get back into our passage, as we get back into 1 Corinthians 14, Paul is continuing his instruction to the Corinthians concerning spiritual gifts. That's been Paul's primary subject in this section of the letter for like two and a half chapters now. And what he's been saying about spiritual gifts for like two and a half chapters now boils down to one word. Spiritual gifts given by God to you and I as believers for others. Spiritual gifts, if you don't remember anything from the last few weeks, spiritual gifts are for others. And sometimes we get muddy in how we talk about it. We'll talk about, well, my spiritual gift, your spiritual gift. And I mean, that, that, that's not wrong as long as we understand they don't belong to us. Yeah, they're given to us, but they're given to us for us to love others. And especially last week, we saw to serve others, to edify others, to build up one another in the Lord. That's church. God's body, loving and serving one another. You know, I was thinking, as COVID restrictions Relax. I'm flying to the East Coast where they're not nearly so relaxed. i got to find my masks again. <laughs> but as COVID restrictions relax here and eventually everywhere, as, as the nation inches its way back to normalcy, relatively, <laughs> man, I've been blessed to see so many people returning to in-person fellowship. At the same time, though, I've had a few conversations with folks. You know, I kind of like going to church in my jammies. I kind of like not having to wake up the kids and feed the kids and wash the kids and drag the kids. It's just easier to stay home. Easier, but not better. Some people need to keep worshiping at home. And then that's not what I'm talking about. If you're home and you need to be home and it's God's first best wisdom for you to stay home, stay home, please. And we're so blessed that, that you can join us this way and, and we can fellowship virtually. It's a blessing to be able to do that. I'm not saying anything against that. For some people, that's God's wisdom. But see, an argument against online church for the rest of us, most of us, most of the time, is, is the very limited opportunity virtual church offers the body of Christ to be the body, to be the church, to use the spiritual gifts we all have to love and serve each other. And praise God for the technology that's gotten us through this past year. I don't know what we would have done without it. And praise God, it will continue to allow short-term accommodation for people who are sick, recovering from surgery, recovering from childbirth. Hi, Hannah. Hi, Ben. We love you. <laughs> At one time or another, it's going to be all of us. Online stream is a great short-term accommodation. But if we look at God's design for the church, it's clear it can't be a long-term solution. Alan Redpath, former pastor of Moody Bible Church and a mentor of one of my mentors, said it bluntly more than 60 years ago, you can only exercise your spiritual gifts in the fellowship of the church. You can't live as a Christian in isolation. And then he went on to say, as you exercise the gifts that God has given you, you're contributing to the whole of the church. It's testimony and it's glory. That's what spiritual gifts are. That's what spiritual gifts are for. All, all of which is review from the last few weeks, but it's important review. I want to start with our feet under us, on the same page about this. Remembering what Paul has been writing about. He's been making sure we understand the what of spiritual gifts. What spiritual gifts are for. They're for others. That's what they are. Now, starting in verse 26, he's going to talk to us about how. How we use spiritual gifts to do the thing that they're there to do. How we love others. That's how he starts the next section, verse 26. How is it then, brethren? How do you do this? We've got these spiritual gifts. How do we use them? Paul's glad we asked. Whenever you come together, and, and mostly he'd be talking about a home group, a small group, a prayer gathering, a home church. Each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. 
Let all things be done for edification, for the building up of one another. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there's no interpreter, let him, the person who's speaking in the tongue, keep silent in the church. If there's no interpreter, okay, well then I guess it's just for me to pray to God quietly, you know, in, in, in my head. Let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak. Don't let tongues be the only gift. And let the others judge. Is this really prophecy? If anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. Don't step on each other. Give each other room. For you can all prophesy one by one that all might learn and all might be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophet are subject to the prophets. Don't tell me that the Lord compelled you to interrupt. God's not like that. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all of the churches of the saints. We said before, the what of spiritual gifts boils down to one word, others. Turns out the how can also be encapsulated in one word, order. Paul says that here in the beginning of the section. He says that again, look down at verse 40. He says that at the very end of the section, let all things be done decently and in order. Order as in, don't all talk at once. Don't let the first voice always win or the loudest voice dominate. Take turns. And, and again, don't make excuses. Oh, the Holy Spirit is taking control. I'm not responsible for what I say or how I say it or who I interrupt when I say it. No, that's not how God works. Yield to one another. Don't let one person monopolize the conversation. Don't let any one gift dictate the interaction. Don't let tongues defeat prophecy or prophecy defeat exhortation or exhortation defeat, defeat teaching. It's not a competition. You're not there to prove anything. We all have spiritual gifts, which means we all have something to contribute. Let everyone contribute. And as they contribute, Paul says, let the Lord guide. You know, in any group, some people will have something to say and some people will just have to say something. If someone speaks in a tongue, okay, Lord, is there an interpretation? No, okay, moving on. If someone offers a prophecy, okay, does it accord with God's word? What does my discernment tell me? Not prophecy, not from the Lord? Okay, moving on. All things decently and in order. Paul emphasizes order because he's well aware. He's heard, he's seen for himself how aggressively our human nature resists limits and pushes up against boundaries. Prideful as we are in our flesh, self-centered as we are in, in the natural. We like rules, but we're mostly convinced they're for other people. I'm glad we have rules for other people to follow. Our human tendency, right, is to make sure that any rules limit other people and liberate us. Yeah, don't do that, Paul says. Put limits in place to make sure that everyone is esteeming others above themselves. If we're all doing that, everyone wins. But you're quenching the spirit. That seems to be the universal response anytime someone in the church bumps up against a boundary they don't like. You're quenching the spirit. I've heard this so many times over the years. Heard it from a woman dancing on the chair, standing on the chair, dancing on the chair in the front of the sanctuary during worship. When I said, hey, what... Love your heart for the Lord. Would you mind doing that in the back of the room so, so you can express yourself but not be a distraction? You're quenching the Spirit. I'm here to teach these people how to worship. You're quenching the Spirit. Heard it from a person during a, Sunday, uh, during a Wednesday evening service who every time I said something would say something. It was, it was, it, I, I thought for a minute that there was simultaneous translation going on but really it was, no, no, elbow, elbow. This is, this is how this applies to you. This is what you need to do with. This is, this is how you need to apply this in your life. To, at, to the point where I, I just stopped and I kind of made eye contact. And she said, what? I'm, I'm exercising my gift of exhortation. Don't quench the spirit. Heard it from the guy who kept singing praise songs after the band left. <laughs> after worship was done, after the teaching had begun, Start a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't... Are we really okay with that song, by the way? That I can't contain and I can't control. Didn't Paul just say that the prophets, the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets? I, th I think we can control. I know it's not what the song means, but... 
You're quenching the spirit, Paul. I'm really not, Paul says. Because Paul understood what we're sometimes slow to grasp. Yeah, order for the sake of order is tyranny. On the other hand, freedom for the sake of freedom, that's just anarchy. That's chaos. Order for the sake of freedom is liberty. That's what God wants for us. Freedom in Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit through Paul is saying to us. Because the Spirit of God, listen, the Spirit of God is the Spirit of order. When a service, when a group, when a gathering, when a meeting gets chaotic, people talking over one another, competing for attention and airtime, it's that kind of prideful humanity that quenches the Spirit. And that's what Paul's calling out. That's the behavior he's correcting. The spirit-led operation of spiritual gifts will always reflect the character of the God who gave us those gifts. I'm going to say that again. The spirit-led operation of spiritual gifts will always reflect the character of the God who gave us those gifts and who ignites those gifts and who is present in those gifts which means spirit-filled teaching, prophecy, interpretation, tongues, exhortation, it's always going to prioritize others. It's always going to personify love, and it's always, listen, it's always going to esteem order. With me? The what is others, the how is order. So with that as context, now we come to verse 34. Let your women which could also be translated wives, keep silent in the churches, for they're not permitted to speak, but they're to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. Yikes. Yikes, especially when this verse and verses like it are plucked from context, taken at face value, and used as an excuse to treat women as second-class citizens. Because whatever Paul, whatever we think Paul was trying to say, that's not what he was going for. How do we know? We know because this is the same Paul who wrote in Galatians 3.28, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. And we know because Paul was a follower of Jesus. Jesus who never treated women with anything other than extraordinary respect. Next time somebody tries to tell you that Jesus hated women, persecuted women, looked down upon women, ask them pol politely, or it defeats the purpose, ask them politely to show you where. Just, just be prepared to wait. You, you might want to clear your schedule because it'll be a while before they give up. Whatever Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 14, he can't be saying, saying that all women must be silent in all churches all the time. It's not consistent with his character or Christ's. Also, not consistent with biblical examples. If women are supposed to be silent and not minister, what do we do with the woman in John 4, the woman who left the conversation with Jesus at the well and proceeds to evangelize her whole village? What do we do with Philip's four daughters in Acts 21, four daughters who, oh yeah, prophesied? What do we do with Priscilla in Acts 18 who corrected Apollos, who had some funky doctrine, corrected him right alongside her husband? What do we do with Hulda? Hulda? Yeah, Halda, 2 Kings 22, lives at the same time as Jeremiah, but is selected by God instead of Jeremiah to deliver some really important prophecies to King Josiah. Okay, but Patrick, are you the same guy who did like five minutes last week on we can't build doctrine from narrative? Yeah, that was me. And that's true, but it doesn't stop us from noticing when biblical examples line up with biblical teaching. And I'm not just talking Galatians 3.28. If we scroll back to 1 Corinthians 11.5, Paul is teaching. It's not just narrative. It's not just observation. We have your instruction, Paul instructing how women are to dress when they pray and prophesy. When they pray and prophesy, he's assuming they will pray and prophesy, and he's talking to them about how they should when they do. What's my point? My point is Paul's not going to contradict himself. 
And he's especially not going to contradict himself within one letter. And he's especially not going to contradict himself in a section of the letter where he just got done saying God's not the author of confusion. So what's going on? This is where you're going to want to lean in. If you checked out, that's cool, but check, check back into the game. What's going on in verses 34, 35 is Paul still talking about what he's been talking about. He's still making the point that worship of a God of order should be orderly. And in Corinth, apparently, it wasn't always. Which is nothing we didn't already know. We already knew worship in Corinth tended to be kind of an unmade bed. How? From how Paul described their communion services back in chapter 11. It was bedlam there, right? So what Paul just got done telling us just, just, just adds to what we already knew, that, that, that now we know it wasn't just chaotic at the Lord's Supper. It was pandemonium and other gatherings as well. So he says, settle down. He says, like, like Vance says to me sometimes, just, just simmer. <laughs> Don't let the people who are talking all at once keep talking all at once. Don't let the people who are speaking in tongues keep speaking in tongues if there's no interpretation. Don't let the people who are prophesying keep prophesying and prophesying and prophesying without stopping to evaluate, is this really from the Lord? And, verse 34, don't let the women who are disrupting the group keep disrupting the group. Don't let disrespectful people keep disrespecting people. Because what does the law teach? Verse 34. Love God and love others. Jesus said that the entirety of the law boils down to those two things. Love God, love others. Love each other better, Paul is saying. Or as he'll, he'll express to the Ephesians, submit to one another in the fear of God. It, Patrick, it, it says keep silent. Yeah, in the King James, it's how it's translated. And people who trip over this verse usually trip over that word. Except here's the thing. The word translated silent here actually means quietness or stillness. The kind of quietness or stillness or tranquility that brings relief from chaos or confusion. And, and the word Paul uses for silence in 1 Timothy 2, it's a different word. But it actually means peaceable, not contentious, as opposed to disruptive or disrespectful. So the picture we get, again, reading these verses in context, Paul's correcting a variety of things he heard about, and an assortment of disorderly practices that were disrupting church services, including women who were interrupting to ask questions that were in some way, shape, or form inappropriate. Inappropriate how? I don't know. Wrong topic, wrong time, wrong tone. There's a lot of speculation around this. One popular theory is that the early church followed the pattern of synagogues and sat men and women separate from one another. We don't know for sure that that's true, that that was true in Corinth specifically, but if it does, then it would make sense that Gentile believers not accustomed to the, the, the rules and the norms and the niceties of the synagogue might be shouting questions to their husbands back and forth across the room. And that's possible. It's plausible. Maybe. But, but that it doesn't have to be true. Because you and I have both been in meetings that prove you don't have to be on opposite sides of the room to be rude. You can be just as obnoxious and impolite sitting right next to someone. Some of you have been doing it this morning. So don't, Paul says. Don't do that. Don't do any of that. And be sure to tell the women who are making a habit of it that they shouldn't do it either. I remember a church that I attended once upon a time that, that, that captured Paul's heart here pretty well, I thought. On, on their bulletins, I, I think it was in the, the, the inside top of their bulletins, they, they said, we don't believe God would interrupt the operation of one spiritual gift with another spiritual gift. So please refrain from tongues or exhortation during the teaching of the word. There's a time and place for all of the gifts, but not at the same time in the same place. I thought that was gentle, but yet direct. So how does Paul's letter to Timothy fit into all of this? Because if you turn to 1 Timothy 2, it's a different letter with a different context, but he says kind of the same thing. 
1 Timothy 2.11, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And then he takes it even further. And I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, fell into transgression. Patrick, I... Okay, I was with you up to... I was with you, but now I'm not. I think maybe you're wrong, because if the same idea shows up in two different letters to two different churches, what, five or six years apart, then this question about women can't be a local issue with a specific group in one particular fellowship. Doesn't this have to be like a general principle for ministry? Yeah, but maybe not the one you think it is. Little background, because we haven't been in 1 Timothy. Paul's writing to his protege who's pastoring the church in Ephesus, 62 AD, we think. And he's writing for reasons not completely different than the reasons he writes to the Corinthians. Timothy's pastoring a church that's having some problems. They've lost their way a little. And most of the problems that church was having revolved around its understanding, or lack of understanding, of leadership. Read 1 Timothy when you have a chance. Leadership is the theme that runs all through the book. And just like in 1 Timothy, uh, I'm sorry, in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul walks us through, here's what the gifts are, others. Here's how the gifts should be used, orderly. In 1 Timothy, Paul talks to Timothy about who should lead the church and then how they should lead the church. And the who, the how is love, because the how is always love. But the who, Paul makes clear in 1 Timothy and elsewhere, are men that have been called and gifted by God for that role. It's actually what we talked about in 1 Corinthians 11. At the beginning of the chapter, we talked about headship. And since we talked about it, I don't have to rehash it here, other, other than to maybe recall, when we studied 1 Corinthians 11, we understood, because Paul makes it really clear, when he talks about male leadership, he's not talking about equality inequality. He's talking about authority. Because this is still the same Paul who wrote, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. It's really clear from, from Paul's writing that men and women are equal in God's eyes and, and, and should be equal in each other's eyes, by the way. But for the sake of order, there it is again, for the sake of order, God has given certain men headship, authority in two specific spheres, marriage and ministry. Not in the business world, not in the academic world, not in the world of politics or the world of finance, but in the leadership of the home and the church. Why those two spheres specifically? Because they're both created specifically, uniquely by God and both intended to picture our relationship with God. God who is distinctly male and God who is a God of order. I said I wasn't going to rehash headship and I'm rehashing headship, but here we are. The point Paul makes in 1 Corinthians 11, God hates anarchy. God's a God of order. Someone has to lead. Everyone can, everyone should have a voice, but someone needs to have the tie-breaking vote and everyone needs to know who that is. Everyone needs to know where headship resides. And in those two specific contexts, marriage and ministry, God has assigned headship to men. Not, not all men over all women all the time. Husbands over their wives. Elders over their church. And apparently, again, if we read in context, some of the women in Ephesus didn't like that. Specifically with regard to the headship of the church, didn't like it, didn't agree with it, weren't going to go along with it, and were putting themselves into leadership roles, teaching and ministering in defiance of the elders, the elders who were men. Which Paul corrects in 1 Timothy 2, just, just like he corrected a similar group in 1 Corinthians 14. And as he corrects them, yeah, he calls out teaching. But it can't just be the fact that they were teaching that Paul had a problem with for all the reasons we talked about earlier. If Paul talks about women prophesying, there's no biblical reason why he would have an issue with them teaching. The issue can't be that they were teaching per se. In context, the issue seems to be they were putting themselves in those roles. They were usurping that authority, we read in the King James. 
They decided instead of serving under authority, they would take authority for themselves. And the problem is that's not God's design for women or for men. Served on a church board years ago. Not this church, not my home church. It, it, was, the, it was the classic little country church on the edge of town. Little country church meeting in an old, hundred-year-old farmhouse, which <clears throat> worked great when the church was getting started. Knocked out the walls on the first floor, so the adults met in kind of a great room. Knocked down the wall between the living room and the dining room. Children's church was on the second floor. There were like four or five bedrooms there. Nursery up in the attic. But see, it got to the point where it needed more space. But when the church, I, I was just outside pastor, because I, I think it's healthy for any board to have some outside people on it for perspective. And so it got to the point where the church needed more space. We talk about expanding. The township says if we do anything at all, if we touch anything, we got to bring it up to code. Wiring, fire, they wanted two fire escapes, separate fire escapes for the second floor and third floor. It wasn't remotely practical is the point. And it wasn't great space to begin with. So, so when it becomes clear, yeah, we're not going to put more money than the house is worth into the house, we decided to sell and like move somewhere else. One member of the church disagrees, like really disagrees. Made it his mission in life to disagree. Demanded we put it up for a vote. We said, that's not really how this church is organized. The board has that authority. Well, then you got to change the bylaws. And he called a church meeting to, to change the bylaws. And no one showed up. <laughs> and, and so he stood one Sunday morning outside the church handing out leaflets, demanding that, that the, the people in the church rise up until we finally told him. We finally told him what Paul is telling Timothy. He needs to tell the women in Ephesus, shh, stifle. <laughs> Settle down, stop being rebellious, and let the people that God has called to lead the church, lead the church. That's what Paul's telling Timothy to do. He's not talking about women so much as he's talking about headship. If it had been men usurping authority, no doubt Paul would have said to Timothy, tell those guys to stay in their lanes. They don't get to decide that they're in charge just because they have a Y chromosome. But see, in Ephesus, where Timothy was pastoring, it was a group of women causing the fuss. So Paul said to Timothy, set the women straight. For their sake, for the sake of the body, tell them this isn't how we do things. Tell them this isn't the order God established. So Patrick, what are you saying? Look at my watch. It's getting to be about the time you need to bottom line us. What are you saying the Bible is saying? If Paul's exhortations to the Corinthians and to Timothy about the Ephesians, if those were local issues, can a woman talk in church? Yeah, decently in an order like anyone else. Can she teach? Can she teach a mixed group? Maybe. I know that's probably not the answer that you want to hear. And it's not particularly the answer I want to give. I'd rather have a clear-cut yes or no, too. But it's interesting. Here at the end of our study, as, as we head to the finish line, we're right back where we started with Paul telling us ministry is to be done decently. That word means authentically, appropriately, honestly, genuinely for others. And it's to be done in order, under control, under authority. And we have to honor both of those principles. For those who want to hear a woman can teach anyone, anywhere, anytime, I sympathize, I, I really sympathize, but at, at the same time, I don't know how you get around the issue of headship. Church leadership, and specifically the role of senior pastor, as ordained by God, is reserved for men called by God. And that's not a local issue. That's everywhere. That's all churches all the time. 1 Corinthians, 1 Timothy, Paul appeals to creation and says headship is part of God's order. And he goes on in our text, verse 36, verse 37, verse 38, he says, if you disagree, you got to take it up with God. Paul's saying, I'm not making the news, I'm just reporting it. I know it's way above Patrick's pay grade. <laughs> Headship in the home and in the church is part of God's order. I don't see any way of getting around that. 
But at the same time, at the same time, Paul has spent like a third of this book so far telling us we're here to love others, urging us to use the spiritual gifts God has given us to bless others and to build his church. So if a woman is gifted to teach others and she's willing to use that gift to serve others, not defiantly, but under authority, I don't know that either of the passages we've looked at definitively preclude that. And I'll admit I'm not completely comfortable saying that. A woman teaching men and women. Yeah, I go here with fear and trembling because it's not what I was taught once upon a time. The thing is, if I'm going to minister decently in an order, then I have to ask myself, do I want to be loyal to what I was taught? Or do I want to be faithful to my best understanding of what the Bible teaches? Can a woman teach a group of men and women? Told you I was going to give you my perspective. And, and the best I can offer on a cloudy Sunday morning in May is, I think it depends. I think it depends on the woman. Is she called to teach anyone? I mean, before we get into should she teach this group or that group, should she be teaching at all? Is that her spiritual gift? And if it is her gift, the next question we have to ask is what's the goal? Does she want to teach as a, as a way of influencing the church, ruling over people, exercising authority, or, or does she just want to love people? Those are questions we need to ask of anyone, male or female, because the proper use of gifts is always about others. Can a woman teach a group of men and women? Depends on the woman, the gifting, the goal. Depends on the men. Remember, the, the, the letter where Paul first raises the question of women in ministry, 1 Corinthians, is the letter where he spends like three chapters talking about meat sacrifice to idols. And the point he makes again and again and again and again in those chapters is what? We need to make decisions that consider the impact of our choices on others. On other believers, on immature believers, on unbelievers. Before a woman were to stand up and teach, I think Paul would have us ask ourselves, is what she's doing or the way that she's doing it something that could potentially stumble a weaker brother? Or sister, for that matter. Is this going to leave people confused about headship, which is a really important doctrine? Can a woman teach a mixed group? I think it depends on the woman, on the man. I think it depends on the teaching. What is she teaching? Is she sharing testimony? Is she sharing a report from the missions field? Or is she unpacking Jewy doctrine like we're doing this morning? Is this in the context of a class or a conference? Is it a Sunday morning who's introducing her? How clear is it that she's under authority? It, I could keep going. I think that you, 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 you get my point. I think you're tracking with me. Can a woman teach a mixed group? I don't think the answer is always for sure. But I don't think the answer is never. I don't think Scripture gives us a neat, tidy formula. I think it depends on a lot of different things, some of which I've named and, and, and some of which I, mean, I could keep going. I think it depends on a lot of things. And I know that answer isn't as satisfying as always or never would be. But, but, but the strange thing is, strange as it might sound, that's actually what makes me think I might be on the right track. Because what sounds more like a heavenly father who's training us up to be his children? What what sounds more like a heavenly father fitting us to be a bride to his son? Stern rules and unchanging algorithms or an invitation to prayerfully assess each unique situation, asking God the Holy Spirit to show us what decently and in order means in this time and in this place and for these people. Because at the end of the day, isn't that what God is asking us to do already? With everything? God, show us how to love. And so, Lord, that's our prayer. Show us how to love. Show us what this means.
for a lot of folks in this room, it's an academic exercise. For some of us, Lord, it has everything to do with how we lead and love your church. Teach us, Lord. As we yield to your ways, to your order, lead us, Lord. Lead us clearly. Lead us compassionately with your love that we might love wisely and well.